Now, I want to talk about goiter because some of you have been asking, you know, what about nodules in the thyroid? Well, well, first of all, remember that a thyroid nodule is a goiter. It's what it is. Okay. Now, some doctors will wait. The nodule itself is technically a smaller and they'll see it. If the doctor does an ultrasound of your thyroid, they'll see that nodule. Um, whereas a goiter, it gets so big that it becomes obvious on the outside. So a doctor examining, you could visually see that goiter in your neck. These foods here are known foods, aside from gluten, aside from dairy, because we said gluten and dairy could both impact thyroid function through molecular mimicry by creating autoimmune disease. These foods, not so much, although any food can induce an autoimmune process, but these foods are known as goitrogens. Okay, and so you can see if you are struggling with a thyroid nodule, okay, you've been diagnosed with a thyroid nodule, and these are staple foods in your diet in a very big way, you might want to reevaluate the quantities of these foods that you're eating, but also you might consider cooking them because when you cook them, you reduce the goitrogenic potential of these foods. So some people will eat a lot of raw broccoli. The raw food movement really, in, in, in my experience anyway, when the raw food movement, this was a number of years ago, got really popular. My clinic was really inundated with raw foodies who were struggling with goiters and other kind of issues because they were eating too much of these and they had a lot of goitrogenic potential. So again, cooking them helps to reduce that. But again, these foods can all contribute to the formation of nodules uh, through the chemicals that they, they contain, those goitrogenic compounds. All right, I promised you tonight that I would, that I would give you a comprehensive test list. So this is, you know, this is what you wanna take to your doctor. So you might wanna capture this, screenshot this. We'll have it available though on, on Gluten Free Society as well. We'll have this information available for you. But if you really wanna get a comprehensive evaluation of how to optimize your thyroid hormone function, you can't stop shy of the classics, okay? Now that's to say the TSH, the T3, and the T4 are what are I would consider the classics. These are the tests that are most commonly performed, okay? And most doctors will stop right there. If they test these three things, they're done. If, and, and then what they do with this information is if your, if your TSH is too high, then they'll medicate you, usually with synthetic hormone. If your T3 or T4 is too low, they'll medicate you. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with thyroid medication. Some people need it. Some people have had their thyroid glands completely removed, uh, radio, radioactive iodine treatment. Um, and in which case, you know, medicine's not a bad idea and, and regulating that medicine by using these tests to help regulate it is not a bad idea either. But the problem is this is just a partial piece of the information. Again, we want more data than, than just this, T3, T4, TSH. And if you have it, your thyroid is intact, medicine may or may not be uh, the, the final end-all be-all solution for you. Again, this is where doing a deeper evaluation of many of these other things, I've seen it in a number of people where they were able to get off of their thyroid medicine. And I've also seen it in cases where they weren't, but they were able to lower their dose. So again, at the end of the day, maybe you'll require medicine, but maybe you won't. And may, or maybe you'll require less medicine. I, my, my advice is if, is if you have less medicine or no medicine, you're better off. Your body's functioning better. So it makes sense to look at these other things. Well, one of the things to look at is RT3. Reverse T3 is an isomer, stereometric isomer, a mirror image of T3. So it's like T3 looking at itself in, in the mirror, right? But the problem with reverse T3 is it's inactive. So if your reverse T3 values are really high, it's oftentimes a sign or a biochemical marker that your conversion, poor conversion to T3. So you're you're poorly converting T4 into active T3. So that reverse T3 can be very, very important to look at. Now, the labs, what they've done over the past three to four years is they've expanded the reference range on this particular test. So if you're asking for a reverse T3, you, you got to keep in mind the new reference range is higher than like 24, I think it's 24.1. 
The old reference range was 20. Okay, so they, they've, they've changed it recently. Um, and in my opinion, it was a wrong move. They, they remember the way labs change the reference ranges is they generally they take the population, about 10,000 samples of the general population, and they create a new reference range to reflect those people that they just tested. But as we see, our population is getting sicker and sicker. As a matter of fact, thyroid medicine is in the top five every year of all prescribed medicines, period. Thyroid medicine is top five. In some years, it's top one, uh, number one. And so we've got an increasing number of incidents of thyroid disease in this country. So when you have an increasing incidence, you can't use the normal population where, where that increasing incidence is prevalent to make reference range changes. And that's my opinion in that. So you really, with reverse T3, you're looking for it to be less than or under 20. You also want to do something called an iodine loading test. Now, an iodine loading test is um, it's a functional iodine evaluation. So what you're really looking at is, is, so loading test, this is urine, and you're looking you're at taking a big bolus of iodine, meaning you take about 50 milligrams of iodine, and then you collect your urine for 24 hours. And this measures how much of that 50 milligrams that you took before the test, how much of it you peed out, you urinated out. And so with an iodine loading test, um, why is it important? Because if you pee out the, the majority of the 50 milligrams of iodine, it means your body needed it. It means your body hung on to it. And, it didn't, and as long as your kidneys are functioning well, it means your body did not want to let that iodine go because it needed it. So an iodine loading test, some, some doctors will measure plasma iodine, which is, I, I don't recommend that. Plasma iodine is not that accurate. And so if you're, if you're doing plasma iodine tests, you're gonna get an inaccurate. The iodine loading test is, is the gold standard if you really wanna to try to evaluate iodine levels. Now, as part of this, uh, there's a part two to an iodine loading test and that's referred to as a halide test. And so what is a halide? Halides, you wanna measure those, especially these two here, bromine and fluoride. Why do we want to measure these? Because these two compete with iodine. They will actually cause an iodine deficiency. And let, let me give you an example. Let's say you drink soda. Sodas are full of bromine, okay? If you buy new clothes, they're sprayed with, with, uh, with anti-flame retardants that contain bromine in them. Um, so bromine can be something you get exposure to through your fabrics. It can be something you get exposure to through soft drinks. It also isn't commonly found in pesticides. A lot of your organobromines and organofluoride are pesticides. So if you have bug guys coming to your house, spraying inside your house, you can get exposure to halides in that, in that way. My advice, if you have a bug guy coming to your house, you have a bug problem, it's better to put a perimeter blockade around the house than to spray inside your house because when you spray inside your house, you get greater degrees of exposure to these potential halogenic uh, toxic compounds. Fluoride, fluoride can be found in tea. Even tea that is not, I mean, tea is not necessarily contaminated with fluoride. Tea is just really good at pulling, pulling fluoride out of the soil. So if you're a heavy tea drinker, two, three cups a day, you might be getting overexposed to fluoride. And so that's something you wanna keep in mind. That, but fluoride also, you know, the obvious, the toothpaste, the mouthwash, the dental chair, the water, if you don't filter your water, it's very, very important that you don't have toxicity of these types of halides because, again, they'll cause iodine deficiency, which will totally disrupt your thyroid hormone function. As far as nutritional testing, you know, you want to get all these nutrients checked, right, and more. These are just the, some of the ones that are important for thyroid hormone function, but the way to measure them accurately is through something called lymphocyte proliferation. And so I've talked about this. I talk about this all the time. Okay, lymphocyte proliferation is the proper methodology for getting nutrition checked. And so again, that, you know, a lot of doctors want to either use, they want to use plasma or they want to use hair testing or they want to use serum testing. And I don't, those are not accurate ways. These are reflections of your last meal, not a reflection of your balance, of your intracellular, an, an intracellular content. You also want to have thyroid antibody testing done. So thyroid antibody testing, many of you, again, get that traditional TSH, T3, T4, and they forego any kind of antibody testing. There's three major thyroid antibodies that, that doctors t traditionally check for. One is called thyroglobulin antibodies. Um, the other one is called TPO, thyroid peroxidase. So um, 
TPO, thyroglobulin antibodies. And then, th so those two are indicative of, of these, these two are indicative of Hashimoto's, which is hypothyroidism. But there's also another type of antibody called um, thyroid stimulating antibodies, TSIs. And these are different. These are an indicator for Graves' disease, which is hyperthyroidism. And sometimes what happens with autoimmune thyroid is a person bounces back and forth between Hashimoto's and Graves. So maybe their original diagnosis was Graves, sometimes goes on, they get medicated, and then they develop Hashimoto's. And then when they get medicated for the Hashimoto's, they redevelop Graves. And so they kind of bounce back and forth. I've seen that be the case with a number of people. So again, those antibodies can be measured and the, why it's important sometimes to measure those because if you know you have autoimmune thyroid disease, then this next one becomes even more important and that's gluten. Okay, the number one known research factor involved, period, in all of research for involved with autoimmune disease is gluten sensitivity. So gluten is the number one scientifically studied cause of autoimmune disease of all forms of autoimmune disease. Whether it doesn't matter what autoimmune disease you're talking about, whether it's thyroid autoimmune uh, or whether it's skin autoimmune or whether it's liver autoimmune or, or whether it's muscle autoimmune, gluten is, is something that needs to be checked for. But particularly we're talking about thyroid tonight, so genetic screening for gluten sensitivity becomes very important. Then we also know that other food allergies can play a role. I, I mentioned goitrogens earlier, but other food allergies can also play a role in the development of thyroid disease. So it's important not just to stop at gluten, but to also look at responses, immune responses to other types of foods to determine how, how best to change your diet. And then chemicals. Look, there are a number of different chemicals that can create, they're, they're, they're chemicals that we know can disrupt your endocrine system. And remember, your thyroid gland is part of your endocrine system. Many of these chemicals affect the thyroid. Look, we just spent the last year in masks. You know, those, 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 those medical masks that people have been wearing with the blue and they're sprayed with Teflon. And inside that Teflon, you know what that primary chemical is? It's called a PFOA, a perfluoral alkyl substance. And that chemical is made with fluoride. So a lot of people have been breathing in excessive fluoride all year for fear of a virus, right? That's, that's, I've seen that a lot this year with, with fluoride testing. We've seen higher levels of fluoride in individuals as a result of potential for mask wearing. Now, this is why I, you know, I mentioned this a number of times. I don't want to get into COVID tonight. But if you're wearing masks still, wear a cloth mask. Wear a cloth mask made from organic material that where your cloth is not being sprayed with bromine based chemicals or you're not it's not being sprayed with a teflon type chemical to prevent you know water where where there's a fluoride issue so again protect yourself from the exposure of those things but there are other chemicals in our environment that we're exposed to a lot of your pesticides we know interact with thyroid and disrupt the thyroid they disrupt the pituitary gland in the brain and so they can cause major endocrine problems with the production of thyroid hormone. As a matter of fact, especially if you have graves, there's been a number of research studies that show that farmers that are exposed to large quantities of pesticides and their family members who also are exposed to the farmer who's got exposure to pesticides have higher incidence of graves disease as a result of the endocrine disruption properties of many of these pesticides and herbicides. So chemical immune response is important to measure. Heavy metal testing, because we know certain metals can disrupt um, thyroid hormone function. We know certain metals can disrupt the way that the body is, um, is recognizing hormones and the way hormone receptors work. We also know that mold and yeast overgrowth can be a major trigger for thyroid dysfunction. So checking for this is not a bad idea. Mycotoxin testing can be very helpful as well because mold, uh, sometimes the mold grows in you. That's what we call yeast when the mold is growing inside of you. And sometimes the mold grows in your house. Okay, and it's external. And if you have external mold exposure, it produces mycotoxins. These mycotoxins can be very disruptive of the kidney. They can be very disruptive of your muscle, of your liver tissue, which affects your conversion of thyroid hormone. And we also know that gut bacteria, I just showed you research on the gut microbiome and how that plays a role with the thyroid axis being very important. So these are things that can be measured. And if you're really trying to get to the root cause of why you have a problem, they should be measured. And if your doctor's not measuring them, you know, my advice is to sit down and say, why aren't you measuring these things? And if they're, if they're not willing to have that conversation, it might be your cue to potentially have or find somebody else who's willing to do that type of testing. Hey, don't forget to check out 
the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.